uh, out of marketing here, uh, and uh, as we say, embraced uh, what we would call uh, uh, national uh, Nazism. I can certainly believe he was a German nationalist, and I mean that in the wider sense of uh, the Germanic people or the Germanic-speaking people. I can't see, for one instance, what uh, Albert uh, Adolf Marr uh, would have found in socialism. To me, most of that would have seemed to be anathema. So I just wonder, was he one of those, uh, what, what, what we call uh, uh, cherry-picking Nazis in that sense of the word? Because, as you say, uh, he would have gone from relative poverty mm. to fairly close to affluence in this country That's here. Right. I mean, he would have led a very, very comfortable lifestyle, uh, you know, when you look at what Ireland was like in the, uh, the late 20s and mm. early 30s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the word socialism as part of that party's name, the National Socialists, mm -hmm. was a misnomer. Sure. Yeah. It, it wasn't Marx and Lenin. <laughs> no, it yes. wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, that title, the title of that party pre-existed Hitler. Hitler joined that party, was formed before him. Mm -hmm. And he latched on to that party, which had started off as a socialist party and ended up as a fascist party. Yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh, it's not mm -hmm. funny, but it's just, yeah. it's ironic how these things change. Sure. So, um, I think the Nazi party had about seven and a half million members. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them were socialists. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the end they weren't socialists. There may have been a few in the beginning, but they were sorted out. Mm -hmm. So, Marr would have just seen... I mean, we're living in a country here where, where, where uh, one party is called Fianna and a Fall. I mean, in the army of destiny, the soldiers, soldiers of destiny, destiny yeah. don't the really think you join an army when you join Fianna Fall. Yes. Yeah. Like Fianna Gael. What does uh, Fianna Gael mean? The, the family of the Gael, or something else. Yeah, yeah. Are you joining yeah. the family? Yes. I think we don't we, tell me you're going to say the Labour Party. Labour work. Party. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it. I think so. It's actually. Uh, I think we're well used to party names not actually representing their, 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 what, what sure. their, yeah. what's in the name. Sure. On that basis, then, I mean, um, uh, Adolf Marr then came to Ireland. He's uh, fairly well uh, situated in the National Museum. Uh, if, if we categorize or split his, uh, you know, his being into two categories: one, the social Marr, uh, and we'll come to that in a second. The other is the professional. My understanding is, is that uh, Albert Bender came to him rather than him going to Albert Bender. Is that, is that um, uh, yeah. You know, in other yeah. words, that Albert Bender had a view, there he is in San Francisco, and he's Irish, as you say, wants to give back something to an emerging nation. Mm. Um, is that um, how you would have interpreted the sequence of events, roughly yeah. speaking? Yeah, he was, uh, Bender was reckoned, he was a visiting academic whose name I'm after forgetting, but he's a very well known Dublin academic at the time, mm -hmm. and he recommended, uh, Bender had sent, already sent Asian art to the National Gallery, okay, yeah. and it wasn't terribly well received. No, I'm sorry, he'd been in touch with National Gallery, but hadn't, he hadn't actually sent it, he just didn't feel as if they had shown much interest. Yeah. He'd already sent um, rare books to Trinity College mm -hmm. to try and set up um, a collection, a rare book collection in the name of his father. Mm -hmm. He didn't seem particularly happy with that either. Okay. And then this academic suggested, there's a good guy down at the National Museum, why don't you send it over to him? Sure. Yeah. So the goods were sent to, to, to Marr in the, in the National Museum. Mm -hmm. And they were, I mean, Asian art, Marr was keeper of Irish antiquities. Exactly, yes. Yeah, so Ancient I mean. Asian art, they are not part of the same brief. Mm -hmm. uh, but somehow they went to the right person because there were other keepers in the National Museum, other officials, and I don't think they would have looked after the material as well. Yeah. But Marr was good. He was a good museum man, and he'd mm -hmm. been, you know, people around him recognised it. And so Bender sent the stuff to Marr. Marr was the right person to receive it, document it, photograph it, exhibit it, thank him for it. Mm. And, and so he left Bender feeling, number one, appreciated, number two, as if his time and his money was being well spent, mm. which the two other institutions hadn't managed to do. Okay. Yeah, the impression I got reading the book, and I may be uh, being a bit uh, unfair on uh, 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 Adolf here, is, is that he was a good operator in the sense that uh, he didn't, this wasn't uh, material he was particularly interested in himself. It didn't seem to have an enormous amount of relevance to Ireland. But hey, I've got a, uh, a rich benefactor, I'll cultivate him, and who knows, somewhere down the track I may be able to trade this. Is that being unfair, you know, in, in the cold light of day? I mean, uh, in other words, that. Um, there was nothing terribly unusual here, but there wasn't anything necessarily uh, 
warm and uh, gracious. If we had given him an Arda or Chalice, he probably would have been uh, much happier. Uh, much happier, yeah. It's not, I, I think your assessment is largely correct. Um, this, Mar saw this stuff as being extraneous. Sure. Ancient, ancient art. And he even says in one of his letters to Bender, you're sending us stuff that perhaps I'm the only person in Ireland who can appreciate this stuff, you know? Yeah. The average Irish person in 1930s mm. Ireland didn't really have that much uh, appreciation mm. of art that came out of the Tang dynasty. You know, what, 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 right? Without being disrespectful, most Irish people at that time probably would have seen the Chinese as savages or something they wouldn't want to. They, their, their knowledge of China would yeah. have been very, very uh, uh, poor. Yes. Yeah. And on top of that, Mar saw the great importance of the National Museum. Do you remember the state was very, very young. Mm -hmm. The National Museum preexisted the, the establishment of the state, mm -hmm. but it had been a British museum, almost like a branch of the na of the British Museum in Dublin. Sure, yes. It saw the world through British eyes. So it exhibited um, loot that had been stolen from the pyramids in India, mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, Egypt, that's still there. Mm -hmm. It exhibited loot that came from ancient Rome, mm -hmm. loot that had basically been sure. looted from other countries, other continents yeah. by the British Empire, and stuck into museum in Dublin. All of which is fine, because it's nice for the people to sure. see that. But Mark came along and said, look, we need to find out who we are. We need to, to, mm -hmm. to, to dig the ground here and dig up the loot and show the Irish people who they are. Like, you know, that we go back thousands of years, that we, this is what we did a thousand years ago, this is how we looked and this is what we wore, and this, you know. And th so Mar said that is the crucial, Irish archaeology is the crucial part, the crucial role of the National Museum of Ireland. And as it discovers what he called Celtic archaeology, he described Ireland as being the great repository of Celtic, ar Celtic archaeology, and of all of Europe, sure. because most of Europe had been dug up and knocked down and burnt and built and the whole lot. Mm. Ireland was in kind of a more closer to pristine condition. It hadn't changed a huge amount over a thousand years, mm -hmm. you know? Well, you could argue that, uh, generally speaking, the British Museum reflected the triumph of uh, British imperialism, yeah. um, and they had no need or no interest in uh, seeing what you may call the triumph of... Uh, um, I I'll use the term Gaelic uh, culture here because um, that's what they would have found. Um, Newgrange is... Uh, uh, which would have been known in that period, but um, wouldn't necessarily have fitted in with the great idea of the empire in which the sun never sets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there could have been other political reasons, which is that uh, if you start to, you know, the, it, going back 100 years in this country, there was obviously tensions going on with one group of people who were British and one group of people who wanted to mm -hmm. try out the British. And uh, the people in charge, they kind of probably wanted the National Museum to reflect their point of view. Mm -hmm. If you start kind of given the other crowd, the Gaelic people, mm. a certain amount of respect and oxygen, you're, you're allowing them to flourish, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to, almost to uh, illustrate that point, when Dare Vlaer got into power, mm. he, wanted, he was in the business of nation building, and he saw in Mar the ideal person to help him nation build, because if there's one way to build a nation, it's to dig stuff out of the ground and say, look, Europe from a proud heritage that goes back 500 years or a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Look, there's something written on this stone or on this piece of paper that shows you have a language that predates the oppressor's arrival, you know? Yeah. And that's what De Valera wanted from the National Museum. Mark comes along and goes, yeah, actually, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, were, yeah. they were a match. Yes, well, the other side of the coin, as you said, uh, uh, he also brought a degree of scientific method to it because one of my uh, favorite stories is the group that was in Britain in the uh, 1890s or thereabouts called the British Israelites who decided mm. that uh, the people of these uh, islands were the lost tribe and they started digging up ta uh, Tara and as you say they, they, got, the 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 they got the shovels out and, uh, and they just made a mess and they didn't find the lost Ark of the Covenant. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, quite an interesting one. Uh, yeah. is it yeah. You know, if you make any more Indiana Joneses, I think they should. <laughs> yeah. You should arrive over in Ireland looking yeah. for the lost art. But I love the uh, the uh, the corollary to that one is that um, you know the nationalists then stopped them doing it, and because you can't do space, they decided that they got the wrong tower because there's a tower just outside Gory. So that's probably where the Ark of the Covenant is. So <laughs> didn't know that. Yeah, so, uh, 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 I'm thankful to uh, the late Raphael Sieve up in the Jewish Museum for telling me that one. Yeah, but uh, I've been. Down to Gory. I'm not too sure that uh, Saint Je Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, has been down there. <coughs> but coming back to that, is that um, uh, when I talk about archaeology being a uh, or a museum being a uh, 
uh, an expression of triumphalism. If we look at the social bar uh, in Ireland, um, it's not obvious why he would have uh, headed up what I would call the Nazi group, uh, because there were other pe powerful people around um, uh, in, in different organisations, whether it was at the Shannon Scheme in the ESB or at the National Stud. How did he get to that? Was it just pure ambition, or uh, was he one of those apparatchiks that was good at working his way through committees? Well, he wasn't the first head of the Nazi group. Uh, that was Fritz Brauser, Colonel yeah. Fritz Brauser, uh, from the, he was also an Austrian, uh, and he was uh, head of the uh, Army School of Music, the Irish sure. Army School of Music, so mm -hmm. the Army Number One Band. But very short, shortly into his uh, tenure as head of the Nazi group, the Irish Army suggested he reconsider that, yeah. because they said you can really only uh, serve one master. Okay. If you're paying your salary, yeah. uh, you should really have your allegiance to us rather than some mm -hmm. guy over in Germany. So that was a fairly quick process. Fritz Brauser stood down. Mm -hmm. Mar was he only stood down from the party, not the band. Oh, cr oh, correct. Oh, he stayed on the band. Oh, yes. you know? and he, he's made a fabulous contribution to, yes. to music in Ireland. Mm -hmm. you know? um, Mar then stepped in. I think he would have been the right guy for it. I, uh, in terms of, you, you use the word um, maybe ambitious or something mm -hmm. else like that. I don't think that that mm -hmm. would have entered into it. It was a small mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. There was no telling that this group would have meant anything. The idea of Hitler as master of Central Europe in his mm -hmm. short period of years, I don't think that was in anybody's mind. Mm -hmm. Mar perhaps would have been mindful of the fact that probably in time he wants to go back and work in the German or Austrian sure. museum. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would expect, like any expat, you've got you know, you're, you're one eye on the, on the current and you've got an eye mm -hmm. on the next move. And I think that, yes, he probably would have liked to bring his kids back to where it in Germany. Mm -hmm. And if you're a member of the governing party, it can't do you any harm. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, ambitious in that respect, yes, but uh, ambitious for the sake of being head of the small expatriate group. Okay. Yeah. Now, the reason why uh, um, I uh, raise that is to say, if you have a look at the activities, um, you could argue, yes, some of it was picnic, but a lot of it was uh, uh, buying into the idea that this wasn't a passing phase, that the regime um, that was in uh, Berlin was going to be around for a while. So we had Hitler Youth here, uh, we had open meetings here, as you, as you mentioned, the two uh, uh, Christmas dinners. Uh, the other bit that I found, and this is, comes back to a uh, uh, personal experience, which I'll, uh, I'll mention to you, they also seem to be trying to attract uh, native-born people that may have had some form of German heritage or even some people who may have had some form of German affiliation um, and I'll, uh, I, I, I'll come to the, uh, the list that you give in the book. How do you feel about that? Because clearly they were doing, uh, out in Balbriggan or wherever it was, out in North County Dublin, we had, you know, we, there, there's photographs of the kids marching, giving the, uh, uh, the salutes, um, you know, it, it, it it, it wasn't something that was uh, covert. It, this was quite oh, the oh, How do you feel about that? Because clearly they were doing, uh, out in Balbriggan or wherever it was, out in North County Dublin, we had those photographs of the kids marching, giving the, uh, the salutes. It wasn't something that was uh, covert. It, this was quite oh, the oh, open. Covert, but in terms, and he was often accused, you see, of trying to convert the locals, and yet there's no evidence of that. To Nazi ideology, or to archaeology is different. The Nazis, and it sounds like Satan the obvious here, the Nazis were ferociously racist uh -huh. and, and prejudiced people. The original idea behind the German colony and the same with the British one was a meeting place for Germans. They didn't want a bunch of paddies arrived. We might be a similar race or even the same race but we, we, they just didn't want us in there. Now they're quite happy to have kid, children of mixed uh, marriages, you know a German father and Irish mother and so on. They would have seen that as being, bringing their lost sheep back into the fold. I came across no evidence that Marr was trying to convert the average Irish person to Nazism. I wouldn't dispute that but I'll, uh, if I just go to a page yeah. here and it's talking about those, this was the 1936 party that you list and it yes. gives lists of people and it comes from an Irish Times report. Most of the people they list are up with German names and then he has uh, Mr. Smiley who's the editor of the Irish Times. Well that's probably good PR as much mm. as anything else. And then we come to a couple here and it's quite interesting. If you have a look he's got a Mr. Devlin. I don't know anything about him. Sean O'Creeve is interesting. He was Dev's brother-in-law. So whatever about mm. doing the convert we were certainly doing a bit of schmoozing. A Forbes and a Cohen who I don't know anything about. The one who I do know something about here is 
a Mr. B. Muntz. Now, Mr. B. Muntz would be a Mr. Bernard Conrad Muntz. How do I know that? Because he lived across the road from me in Fairview. In the 50s, whatever about collocating Irish people at that period of time, these people had a Nazi flag over their fireplace in the 50s. Maybe these were trying to ingratiate. He, so he was a German and Irish man. He was an Irish man. Yeah. Of German extract. If I go through the census, he was born here. He was, uh, he was baptised here. We always remember because his daughter was the one who was still living there when I was a kid. He was an openly Nazi in the mid-50s. Mm-hmm. And that's why, this is why I raised the issue of triumphalism, is, is that in 1936, they couldn't have seen what was going to be happening 10 years down the track. Sure, yeah. If you're building a, uh, a structure, you're putting in a foundation that's going to be there to last. Yeah. That's what I would have said they were doing then. That at least in 1936, mm-hmm. there's an element of that there, of at least reaching out to sympathetic members of the local population. I, and I accept that. Reaching out to sympathetic members, I, I said a moment ago that they weren't trying to convert the local populace or something like that. I, but I think you can do both. You can not try and convert. Smiley, if I remember correctly, had spent time in Germany, I think maybe covering the First World War, and he had German. So you can see how Mar would meet him and sure. also like to get stuff printed in the Irish sure, Times, yeah. you know, particularly an archaeological point of view. I couldn't tell you, I don't know enough about Devon or anybody else. And what I was trying to say was that I have never come across an article, for example, in any of the papers that was signed by A. Mar, heads of the local Nazi group, condemning the Jews or the yeah, Hitler so, yeah. or anything else like that, yeah. you know? So in the regular course of his work, or the community's work, you can see how a few strays would arrive into uh, the Christmas party. If this is the one up in the Gresham Hotel yeah. or one of those, which isn't quite the same as trying to convert them. Call it reaching out, or you could just call it normal social relations. They were children's parties. This is yeah. Christmas parties. They weren't political because actually they were political. They were political in that sense that yeah. the, the photograph show they had swastikas and flags and swastikas yes. and things like that. But, yeah, I mean, but they were also like children's songs and Christmas carols mm-hmm. and German food and stuff mm-hmm. like that. They were they were yeah, they were mm-hmm. political, but they were also social. Yeah. Let's move on to the war. He ends up in uh, in Germany by accident. Or the, yeah. Well, stuck in Germany by accident. He went yeah. there for a conference. I would have said at that point in time, you're possibly a bit, not sympathetic, but a bit soft on him in that sense of the word. Because, okay, he may have been trapped there. For the first couple of years, it did look like the Nazis would prevail and therefore, mm. at that point in time, would uh, Adolf uh, Maher had ambition to, to come back to Ireland as, uh, in the position he had or do you think he uh, had ambition to progress his career through the regime in Germany? Well, the evidence is, I remember when I started writing this book, the very first person I ever spoke to about Adolf Marr when I was trying to find out who this A. Marr guy was. Yeah. They described him as being a German spy who lives in Ireland who, just before World War II, while he was being investigated by the Gardaí, escaped back to Germany with maps and other yeah. documents. So that was it. That was the common perception of Marr. I could find very little evidence really that he was a spy. He certainly was followed by G2, the military yeah. intelligence. Escaped back to Germany. The only evidence I could ever find was that he got trapped there. I could never find any evidence that he purposely ended up there for World War II. And there's evidence to show he tried to get back. And there's evidence to show that he couldn't get back and there's evidence to show he had written to the museum and the department had given him leave absence after the war was over that you know they understood his position I have been accused of being a little bit soft yeah. on in this regard but I can only go with the evidence and the evidence points towards a guy who got inadvertently okay. trapped does the fact but, that say military intelligence took an interest in him indicate something in itself or should we just say well that's what these people do because they seem wary of him well it's their job to be wary of people particularly as as a war about 1937 it seemed that we were set for war military intelligence if anything they were late to the party you know they maybe should have been tracking them before I think they only started to turn up the heat around 1938 wasn't they were organising okay, yes. even if it was just largely social to answer your question because you asked me about um, could he have uh, expected to go up the ranks yeah. in the German regime if that was his plan it was hopelessly badly executed he had a nice job nice lifestyle nice yeah. everything in Dublin yeah. prestige the whole lot his library of books very yeah. very important nowadays we have Google but in those yeah. days you had to have a oh. library kids in school yeah. everything he had everything he needed in Dublin and he finds himself living in relative houses in Austria the kids have only got summer clothes in the middle of Austria in winter and he never got a job from the regime in archaeology barely got a job he did have a job in Germany shortly shortly before he died in archaeology but basically if that was ever part of his plan it was hopelessly badly executed and he should have known that war or no war his life in Dublin was it or where it was at and if he was going to move he should be very very careful about how to organise it and he was capable of organising it but certainly arriving over unannounced into Germany kind of going hey I'm here that wasn't going to work he had been a fairly young archaeologist in Austria before the war he'd never worked in Germany it's a bit like us in Britain we might have the same language but it's a different government so even if we were united yes. at some stage you can't just walk into Britain and go hey I'm here on that basis then briefly touching on the spy is there any evidence that he had any connections or any liaisons at all with the IRA figures I've never come across any yeah and that adds to and I think if, if there had been any worthwhile connection mm-hmm. I think they would have been highlighted by now it would have arrived at some other manuscript or whatever there was the odd person he met who would have had IRA sympathies he was friendly with the Tlismans he was friendly with the 
fellow called Joseph Ahaney who worked in the museum who's an IRA man there may be one or two others but in terms of any kind of a substantial link I think if he had that or if he had been reaching out to them or trying to organise something it would have come out by now and certainly didn't come out when I was researching this book The most controversial aspect from an Irish perspective about Adolf Maher during the war I'm prepared to believe his position was so low that he certainly played very little if any part yeah, in the show even prepared to believe he didn't necessarily know exactly what was happening however the most controversial aspect with him was he was making broadcasts back to Ireland in a way that say William Joyce was and so on and so forth you've tended to imply that he did that but they weren't necessarily very effective that they were all in the Irish language and so on and so forth others got killed others got uh, treated as war criminals for that or at least had very severe punishment meted out do you have any uh, change of perception on, on Mars contribution in that regard is that at the very least he was a collaborator he wasn't necessarily an active uh, combatant yeah. but he was a, he would have certainly been considered a propagandist for the regime well collaborator is a fair word yeah. propagandist for the regime is a fair word but if you dig a little bit deeper his propaganda it, it was in Irish and in English sure, uh, yeah. just to clarify that it wasn't of a hate filled nature it was of a cultural nature first of all it was legal insofar as he was advocating Irish neutrality which was entirely in line with the government policy at the time he was advocating in fact it was a very sensible thing to, to advocate Irish neutrality because the last thing we wanted was firing him into the war we would have been hopelessly in a, in a hopeless situation so he felt he was doing nothing wrong and I remember the Irish government knew this and he had been speaking with Irish Charged Affairs over in, over in Berlin and they knew about it I don't think the Irish government ever tried to stop the broadcast I'm not aware of any efforts I don't recall any hateful message uh, of the style that you would expect of the Nazi now you mentioned about horrible punishments being meted out to other people in his position so you mean Joyce I'd say, Joyce you know? but he was broadcasting first of all into a different jurisdiction Germany and Britain were at war and he was working for the enemy Germany and Northern Ireland weren't at war so part, he, part of it was Northern, Northern Ireland, Ireland yes. yeah, okay, you can, uh, but certainly Mar wasn't working for the enemy because Ireland didn't have an enemy Ireland was a sure. neutral yeah. country at the time Joyce was working for the enemy and on top of that there was a certain amount of vitriol and different things like that that he poured out Joyce wasn't making cultural programmes on the history of Britain and mm. talking about the glorious past and all this sure. whereas Mar's stuff was they're not directly comparable and you could even argue about the legality of, of Joyce's uh, execution but that's sure. a whole other thing I think the Nazis had something like 54 radio stations going to India the United States of America obviously Britain and Ireland and in each one they had a different audience so they did a different message right. he was a propagandist he was part of all that so if you say that and this is what I'm trying to do in the book and this is what I'm trying yeah. to do in the book which is that if you just give somebody one word like Nazi propagandist whatever collaborator you're giving them one word that has many 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 different meanings because it actually to be accurate about it it represents a whole spectrum of activity and I think that somehow we shorten it in this particular culture but probably every culture we give that one word one meaning and we decide automatically where that person is in that spectrum and I don't think that that's an accurate way of doing things and what I was trying to do in this book was to place them yes he was a collaborator but where was he was he here or was he here yes he was a Nazi but where was he was he here or was he here yes he was a propagandist but was he here or was he here in investigating that what I feel I did which was with integrity and I felt with as much honesty and accuracy as I could I leave myself open to not being hard enough on the guy but I don't think that that's a fair accusation I think every historian should aim to be as accurate and as open as possible I do come across publication even when this book was, was reviewed in one of Ireland's more prominent papers I was accused of being a bit woolly and mar a bit soft and all, all that sort of thing and I felt that the historian let himself down because a historian shouldn't have a political angle he should just have the history and describe it as best he can I met another very prominent historian when I was researching this book and I went up to him and I said to him at a function I said you know because I thought he'd be very interested I'm doing a book on Adolf Marr the former head of the Nazi, yeah. the Nazi part now very few people now knew much about Marr at the time because I had found every publication about him and the guy turned to me and says I hope there isn't a single good word about him in the book and that's a very prominent historian who obviously I won't name and I was shocked how could he suggest that there wouldn't be a single good word about Marr in the book that suggests I should be writing it from a particular point of view that point of view might correct for me Jerry Mullins the individual but it would be entirely incorrect of me the historian or journalist to write a book from that perspective and then I have to look at that other historian and go how can you base a career as a historian if you're entering into every publication with a biased point of view or with your own personal point of view it's entirely wrong and if it means try to be correct you leave yourself open to criticism well you just have to look back at the criticisers and say look you know you guys need to up your game a bit last then Jerry I mean Adolf Marr his last couple of years <laughs> wasn't allowed back to Ireland got a bit of a pension but wasn't allowed back here his last few years let's be honest weren't very pleasant you know from the end of the war to the time he died which wasn't a, a long period of time how do you feel about that having written the book done the research spoken to commentators read reviews do you feel at the end of the day that fate treated Adolf Marr justly or was he hard done by him? you obviously have a great deal of respect and sympathy for him as an, a 
you know, an archaeologist. But at the end of the day, there's a sort of they can be cruel, and how he mm. how he ended up to me. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh, but I uh, I always have difficulty as uh, Nazis as victims. <laughs> Sorry, guys, you weren't. And that's why at the end of the day, I thought, well, probably what befell Adolf Marr was perhaps just about right. Wouldn't have liked to see him hang, but I wouldn't have also liked to see him go and head up the Bundesbank like a few others did. It's a very philosophical question. You might be right that his fate got it right. First of all, Marr survived the war. He did, yeah. Secondly, his yeah. four children survived the yeah. war. And in time, even though they all suffered, but in time they lived very, very full and reasonably happy, productive life. That puts Marr away ahead of hundreds of millions of people. Hundreds of millions sure. of people whose lives were destroyed. Some of whom were very, very much worse people than him and some of whom were very much better people than him. So Marr somehow managed to survive the war and he himself suffered a great deal. He lost his career. Relatives were raped and murdered. Friends were killed. His country was in ruins. He suffered a great deal and as you say there might be a certain justice in that because he did he did he was a collaborator simple yeah. as that having said all that he was prevented from coming back to Ireland which was not legal he had never offended Ireland he had never broken the law in Ireland he had never gone against Ireland as a country he had been on leave of absence and he had it in writing he was entitled to come back and collect his job so legally he was badly treated however he was part of an organisation that legally badly treated dozens of millions of people I only tried to tell the story in the book I didn't try to elicit sympathy for him but you can't help but reading about this old man who's getting old before his time in bad health living in desperate conditions and you look back at this proud man who, who was head of the museum in Dublin only a decade and a half earlier you can't help feel a certain degree of sympathy but I would leave it up to the, the reader and to the viewer to decide I, I try not to leave I try not to leave them you know? well I think one of the great things about the book Jerry it's called Dublin no, Dublin Nazi number one the life of Adolf Marr is you've probably given people another ten books there I mean there's a book alone just on Albert Bender I suspect mm. there's a book alone perhaps on his daughter there's a whole there's a whole range of uh, other books there there's half a dozen books that the Irish Catholic Church would not like to uh, see come out as well Jerry Mullins it's been a tremendous uh, talking to you of course the Albert Bender uh, collection is down in Collins Barracks as well so free of charge Jerry it's been a pleasure thank you thanks very much